Ah, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. All right, hope everybody has a good morning today. Uh, let's take our seats. We'll start with the Parsha. Uh, today's Parsha is by Kanan, and it means, and I pleaded. Torah portion is in Devarim, Deuteronomy, chapter 3, and it goes through chapter 7. And I pleaded. The parasha begins with uh, Moshe pleading with the Lord, saying, O Lord God, thou hast begun to show thy servant thy greatness and thy mighty hand for what God is there in heaven or in earth that can do according to thy works and according to thy might. He also asked if he could go over and see the good land beyond Jordan and the goodly mountain and Lebanon. But he said that the Lord was angry with him for their sakes and told him not to speak again of the matter. He told him, to behold, but he would not go over. He also said, but charge Joshua and encourage him and strengthen him for he shall go over before this people and he shall cause them to inherit the land which thou shalt see. Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you. For to do them that ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish anything or aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Moshe reminds them of the things that the Lord has done for them and because of them, including the giving of the covenant. He told them how to seek God when they are in tribulation and reminds them of God's mercy and love and also how God loved their fathers. Yet he reminds them how God made a covenant with the people in Horeb and not with their fathers. He spoke with them face to face in the mount out of the fire. And then he gave them again, Asaret HaDevarot, which are the Ten Commandments. Moshe tells them, you shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you, that you may live and that it may be well with you, and that you may prolong your days in the land which you shall possess. Moshe also gives the people the Shema and the Ve'ahafta and in the 25th verse it reads, and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord, our God, as he hath commanded us. He finally warns them, giving strict orders not to have mercy on the enemy that they are to destroy and not to make marriages with them because his people are a holy people unto God. And he tells them, thou shalt therefore keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I command thee this day to do them. The half, half the portion is in Yeshayahu, Isaiah, chapter 40. And it begins, Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. He is to tell Yerushalayim that their iniquity is pardoned. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. He gives them many words of questions and encouragement and says, lift your, lift up your eyes on high and behold who hath created these things that bringeth out the host, their host by number. He calleth them all by names by the greatness of his might for that he is strong in power. Not one faileth. The Barit Kadashah portion comes from Mark chapter 12 where Yeshua is asked by a scribe, what is the first commandment of all? And he answered with portions of the Shema and the Ve'ahafta. He also said, the second is, love thy neighbor as thyself, and said, there is none greater than these. We can see from the pleading of Moshe to the explanation given by Yeshua that the most important thing that we can be given as believers is the Torah, the commandments of God, the words of God. They are life, they give life, and encourage, and are never failing. We are to trust them because we trust him. We are to be true believers. In a chapter, Yeshayahu tells us that our righteousness goes before us. And Mark chapter 16 tells us that the signs follow us. Let's make the choice today to be faithful to the one who is faithful to us. Amen? Shofarim, please.
praise you, holy, holy, holy God. I learned this week, Mayiri do Mishkinoteka, how beloved is thy dwelling place, Lord. We are so blessed to come together this morning and hear the words from your scriptures, Lord, to be together in one accord as you are teaching us this week. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. We are a cod with you, Father. We love you with all of our hearts, and we thank you and praise you. And we do lift up our eyes unto you, Lord God, to give you praise and honor this morning. We look forward to what you have for us this morning, what you have prepared for us as a meal. And we've come together here in this place to hear. And we open our ears, Father, and we attune ourselves to hear exactly what you have for us. Come, Holy Spirit, fall on this place this morning. Touch each person. Move in this place in a mighty way. We've been apart for a week, Lord, and we just are excited to be together with you. We want to eat from your table and drink the water that you have for us. Father, be with those that can't be with us this morning. Touch them. Let them feel your presence. We just love you so much. We ask, Father, that you would be blessed by our worship and that you, Lord God, the forgiver of our sins, would forgive us, Lord, if we've trespassed in any way. Allow your Ruach HaKodesh to move in this place. We welcome you this morning in Yeshua's name. Anoint Brian, Father, as he brings forth your word. Amen. 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 We'll stand together. For how lovely the tents of Jacob in the dwelling places of oh, Israel. Matovu Ohalecha Yaakov Mishkenote Yaakov Mishkenotze Ka Yisrael Shaftim Mayim Besesom Mimane Yeshua Shaftim Mayim Besesom Mimane Yeshua Mayim, 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 Mayim Oh my imbes is some my in my in my in my in Oh my imbes is some Hey 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 my in my in my in my in my in my in best is some my my in my in my in my in best is some shaft in my in best is some me my nay I yes you were shaft in my in best is some me my nay I yes you were my in my in my in my in Oh my best is so my and my and my and my Oh my best is so Hey Hey Oh my and my and my and my and my and my and best is so my Oh my and my and my and my and best is so Therefore with joy we shall draw water from the wells of Yeshua Amen amen You may be seated All right Shabbat Shalom Baruchuat Adonai Hamvarach, Baruch Adonai Hamvarach Le'olam Vayed. Bless the Lord, the Blessed One. Blessed is the Lord, the Blessed One, for all eternity. The children of Israel shall keep the Shabbat, observing it throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Shabbat to another, 
All flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Blessing of Mashiach Yeshua together. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher natan lanu et derech hayeshua b'mashiach Yeshua. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the way of salvation in Messiah Yeshua. Amen. May all stand for the Shema. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kavu Malkito Le'olam v'ayin Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom forever and ever. Amen. Vahafta et Adonai Lohecha, Bukholavavkov, Konashakov, Komodeka. Vahayu Hadvarim Ha Ele, Asher Anukim at Savka Hayom, Alla Vaveka. Vashina Talavanak with the Bartabam, Vashivka Bevetaka, Uvlatka Vadera, Ushapka Ufumeka, Ukshatam Liot Ayadeka, Vahilet Letot Vobene Neka, Uktatam Mazot Beteka, Uvi Shurecha. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them for a sign upon your hand and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Ve'afta l'riacha kamoka. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God and God of our fathers, God of Avraham, God of Yitzchak, and God of Yaakov, the great, mighty, and awesome God, the most high God, bestows grace and creates all, and remembers the kindnesses of the fathers and brings a redeemer to the children's children for his name's sake with love. O King, helper, savior, and shield, Blessed are you, O Lord, shield of Avraham. You are eternally mighty, my Lord, the resurrector of the dead are you, abundantly able to save, who sustains the living with kindness, resurrects the dead with abundant mercy, supports the fallen, heals the sick, releases the confined, and maintains his faith to those asleep in the dust. Who is like you, O master of mighty deeds, and who is comparable to you, O king, who causes death, and restores life and makes salvation sprout. Now our God and God of our fathers, may be pleased with our rest. Sanctify us in your commandments and grant us our portion in your Torah. Satisfy us from your goodness and make us rejoice in your salvation and purify our hearts to serve you in truth. In love and favor, O Lord our God, grant us your holy Shabbat as a heritage of May Israel, who sanctifies your name, rest therein. Baruch atah Adonai, Mekadesh HaShabbat. Blessed are you, O Lord, who makes the Shabbat holy. Magnified and sanctified be his great name in the world that he has created according to his will. May he establish his kingdom during your life and during your days, and during the life of the whole house of Israel, even swiftly and soon, and all say, Amen. 
Let his great name be blessed forever and to all eternity. Blessed, praised, and glorified, exalted, extolled, and honored, magnified and lauded be the name of the Holy One. Blessed is he, though he be high above all blessings and songs, praises and consolations which are uttered in the world, and all say, May you make peace in his high places, make peace upon us, upon all Israel, and say, Amen. Yitzgadol, Yitzgadashi Meraba, Ramadi Virkirti, Vyamik Makote, Bekaikon, Vyomokon, of Kai de Kol, Beit Israel, Bagolav is man, Karivimru. Yeish Meraba, Mevrak, Leolam, Wome, Omaya. Yit Barak, Vishtapak, Vit Paav, your mamam, Vitna save at the dar, Vitaleva Talel, Shmelkur Shabri Hum. Leolmin Kobrakata, Vishra to Tushbekata, Venek Mata Damiram, Bama, Vimru. Amen. Amen. Shalom bim ramav, hu ya se shalom aleinu, ve ya ko Yisrael, vibru imru amen. Ya se shalom, ya se shalom. Shalom Aleinu, Yako Yisrael, Yase Shalom, Yase Shalom, Shalom Aleinu, Yako Yisrael, Yase Shalom, Yase Shalom, Shalom Aleinu, Yako Yisrael. Yase Shalom, Yase Shalom, Shalom Aleinu, Yako Yisrael. May he who makes peace in high places make peace for Israel and all mankind and say, Amen, Amen, Amen. Wonder and awe surround you, Lord. Oh, glory and fire like the wind. Day after day, the heavens proclaim the beauty of the Holy One. Wonder and awe surround you, Lord. All glory and fire like the wind. On day after day, the heavens proclaim the beauty of the Holy One. And we will respond with joy in our song. Your Enemies rise, your enemies fall, the fire consumes them all. There is none so high and holy, the King of kings, the one and only. You are the Lord, you are the Fire cuts. 
I lift my voice, I lift my praise to Thee. I lift my hands, I lift my worship to You, and I love You more than I can say. Oh, I love You more than I can say. Ever I will sing, oh, here will I adore. Glorify my Lord, all the year will I serve, for the world will fade away. Still my song to you remains, all the year will I adore. Oh, I lift my voice, I lift my praise to you, I lift my Come move in your power, 
When the ark would travel, Moshe would say, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let them that hate you flee from you. The prophet of Zion shall go forth, the Torah and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Blessed be he who in his holiness gave the Torah to his people, Israel. Yamod Yoel ben Avraham la Torah. Baruch et Adonai Hamvarach. Baruch Adonai Hamvarach Leolam Vayed. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Bakubenu Mikol Amin, Vinatan Lanut Et Torato, Baruch Atah Adonai Notain Ha Torah. Bless the Lord, the Blessed One. Blessed is the Lord, the Blessed One for all eternity. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all peoples and given us his Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver. Of the Torah. Amen. Yeladim.
thank you, O oh Lord, for these blessed children and the families that they represent. May they be blessed abundantly as Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, Ephraim, and Manasseh. Lord, I ask that you place a hedge around each and every one of them, Lord, to protect them from the sickness that's around about us and, and the evil that floats around about us, Lord, that we see manifesting itself in this world today. Lord, I also ask that you keep them safe, that they, once they reach that age of understanding, they realize, Yeshua, who you are, and they will accept you as their Mashiach, that you will surround them with godly men and women who will assist them on their life's journey. We just thank you for them, O oh Lord. They're such a blessing to us, O oh Lord, in Yeshua's name. Amen. Vet Kanan El Adonai Bet Ahiv Lemor Adonai Adonai Ata Achilot Lehrot Et Avdecham Et Gadlcha Vet Yadka Hakazaka Asher Mi Miel Bashemaim Varet Asher Yase Kima Asecha Vakig Vurotecha Ebranam the Erae et Haaretz Hatova Asher Baver Hayaren Hahar Hatov Haze Vahalvanon And I besought the Lord at that time, saying, O Lord God, thou hast begun to show thy servants thy greatness and thy mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth that can do according to thy works and according to thy might? I pray thee, let me, let me go over and, and see the good land that is beyond the Jordan and the goodly mountain in Lebanon. Amen. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Asher Natan Lanu, to already met Vachyei Olam Nate. Tokenu, Barukata Adonai, Notain Ha Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and has planted eternal life within us. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Vizot Ha Torah, Asher Sam Moshe, Lifne Bene Israel, Al Pi Adonai Biad Moshe. And this is the Torah that Moses placed before the children of Israel at the command of the Lord through Moses' hand. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This Torah scroll is the Word of God, Yeshua is this Word. John the Immerser said in John 1.29, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God's Word is written on lambskin, and Yeshua is this Lamb. In John 12.32, Yeshua said, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. The two wooden poles holding this Torah scroll are called Eitzchaim, or Tree of Life, and Yeshua sacrificed on two wooden poles some 2,000 years ago for our sins. Amen. Eitzchaim hi lamachatzikim bar, v'tom kehar mushar darche darche noam, v'kol nativo teha shalom, hashavenu Adonai, alecha v'neshuva kakadesh yemenu kakadim. Is a tree of life to those who take hold of it, and happy are those who support it. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. Cause us to return to you, Adonai, and we shall return. Renew our days as of old. Revelation 2, 7 reads, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the congregations. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Yeshua was, he is, and he shall ever be this word of the one living God that we look upon this day for our salvation. Amen? Amen. You may be seated.
Shabbat Shalom. Before I begin my teaching today, if we can, um, if you could join me in prayer. Lord Yeshua, we praise you, we exalt you, we lift your name on high. We thank you so much for the, the blessing of Shabbat. We thank you so much for the blessing of this community. We thank you so much for allowing us this island of time that it causes us to stop everything we are doing in the world and come and to be refreshed at your banqueting table. Lord, I pray that you would fill this place with your spirit. I pray that you would help us to take away all thoughts, all flesh out of this place, all out of our mind, so that we would be able to focus only on you, that we would be empty of anything that is not of you, and that we would sit patiently waiting for you, Lord, for you to touch our hearts, for you to prick our hearts to cause us to be awakened, to cause us to go forward in our lives, to do your will, Lord. Lord, I pray a special blessing on each person in this place. I pray you reach out to them, that you would cover them, you wrap your arms of love around them, and you show them who you are. I love you, Yeshua. We love you. We praise you. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. So hopefully everyone's had a, a great week. Hopefully everyone's excited uh, to be here um, and been seeking to be here all week. Over the past couple of uh, weeks, God has been impressing upon my heart the need for his people, the need for us to be open and willing to be used by him. I think now is a time, now is a huge opportunity for all of us if we are, have not been active in our lives and engaging and going out into the world, helping, seeking to awaken souls, whatever it might be, now is the opportune time to do so. When we are used by him, when we are open and willing to be, you know, I'm not necessarily talking about, you know, in a mighty or miraculous way, in, in splitting seas, or breaking down walls, but simply just to be open, to be engaged enough, to be engaged enough and focused enough in our lives on what God is doing around us or what God wants to do in the hearts of man. Just enough to have our time focused on helping those who need help. Spending time going to the needy, the hungry, the naked. And out of these simple acts of love, out of these simple acts of chesed, this loving kindness, the Hebrew word in the, uh, in the Tanakh is chesed, which means loving kindness, which is an actionable love. Not just saying I love you, but actually doing something to show that you love that person or that you care for that person. You know, darkness is persisting all around us in our daily lives, in our world, in our country, all throughout the globe. It is up to us through God's Ha or through his light that he emanates and pushes into each one of his own for us to let that light of chesed, that light of loving kindness to shine for all those nations round about us, all those people who are not a part, of, who have not been awoken yet or not been a part, not a part of the flock yet, all those people to see, to see it and to want it, to see it and be attracted to it. As we have been discussing and experiencing over these past several months, we live in extremely interesting and unique times for us in our generations. There has been many different events, topics, issues raised throughout our society that has created a disruptive, tumultuous environment to live. To those without God and maybe even those with God, this time can be uneasy, unnerving, wondering how this country will ever return back to normal. Wondering how these events will affect our kids, how they affect our jobs, our health, our families. So many different aspects at play in our society that for a variety of reasons and in a variety of ways can cause many, even those that are of God's flock, can cause many to lose focus, to get weighed down, or even to become paralyzed. 
As believers, I think it's imperative during these times to remember who we stand before, to remember what he does in the midst of storms. And importantly, and most importantly, in my opinion, for each of us to know what he requires of us during these times, what he desires of us during these times of upheaval. I believe our, we are in a period of time in which God is calling his chosen to awaken, especially those in societies, nations, where comfort and peace have reigned for many, many, many years. You know, I, I specifically look at the Western civilization, you know, especially if you want to look at United States specifically. You know, it's been a long time since we've been to a place where it doesn't feel as comfortable anymore. It doesn't feel as peaceful anymore. I believe there's a purpose to it, regardless of how it started or why it started. I believe God is using it. I believe God is using it to awaken those who are asleep, whether those who are asleep who have fallen a, a slumber and that are a part of the flock or those who didn't know Yeshua, who don't know Yeshua. And I feel like he's using this to waken them up and to introduce himself to them. When we look at examples in the Bible and throughout time, we see God making his greatest impacts. We see God causing a revival, or a better biblical term, causing an awakening to occur amongst his people during times of uncertainty, times of distress. Put quite simply, times where there is a heightened need for the people of God to call upon his name. Traditionally, when things are peaceful, comfortable, many do not call out to God for his deliverance. Many do not earnestly seek him to show up in a fashion that causes souls to be awakened for the first time or even to be reawakened in their walk with God. Sure, many believers offer prayers. Many believers offer thanksgivings, attend Bible studies and Shabbat services. But the engagement level from a place of comfort is definitely different than one from needing deliverance from something. The prayers that went up from the Israelites when enslaved in Egypt, the cries for help, were definitely different from the prayers that went up when they were comfortably settled in the land, enjoying land flowing with milk and honey. With that said, I believe we live in an age where many throughout our society, our nation, our communities, and even our world are experiencing an upheaval in their normal lives. I believe many are seeking, calling, asking to be saved from their current situations. And even if they don't realize it yet, asking for an awakening in their souls, God is using the physical situations of the world to cause people to ask for help, even if they don't realize what they're asking for. They're, they might be asking for help in a physical, God, I'm poor, help me. God, I have no clothes, help me. God, I'm lost, help me. They might just be seeking a physical resolution, but God has different, a different ending for them. God's seeking to awaken their souls to spiritually be clothed. Regardless of how and why all these events have occurred, I believe God is using our current environment for good, to build faith, to bring many into the fold of God. God is causing an awakening to occur. He is showing up to many and he is cultivating his harvest for his workers to glean. The question is, are there enough? Are there enough laborers? Are there enough workers to glean the harvest that he's making ready? Matthew 9, verses 35 through 38 states, And Yeshua went out about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. And he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion because they were weary and scattered. There were so many of them who did not have a shepherd to lead them. You know, Yeshua's asking for all those to pray, to pray that those would be sent out to the harvest, 
that laborers upon laborers upon laborers would be sent out to those who are weary and scattered. There are many in the communities we live around that are weary, that are scattered as sheep with no shepherd, in need of laborers of God to come to them. The question is, will those laborers be ready? Will they be available, be open, or even notice that there are people out there who are weary and scattered? In the Torah portion of this parasha this week, Moses continues his recounting of what God had done for the Israelites in freeing them from Egypt, how he spoke to them from the mountain of God concerning the instructions they should follow for a long life and how he has them on the cusp of entering a land that has been promised to them for many generations. He conveys this message in Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 10, which states, Surely I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is wise in understanding people. For what great nation is there that has God so near to it, as the Lord our God is to us? For whatever reason we may call upon him, and what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I have set before you this day? Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. And teach them to your children and your grandchildren, especially concerning the day you stood before the Lord your God in Horeb, when the Lord said to me, Gather the people to me, and I will let them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth, and that they may teach their children. During his message, Moses emphasizes a point that speaks volumes to not only how Israel was supposed to act and serve God, but also the light or example in which God was going to use them to be for the nations round about them. And you know, we see back in these verses, both verse 6 and 9, verse 6 talks about how, therefore be careful to observe the statutes and commands, for this will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of all the peoples, for that they will say, surely this great nation is wise. So through following God, his instructions, his commands, the people of Israel were seen as a light all, by all the nations round about them. But of course, he makes sure to emphasize the fact that he says, but take heed to yourself that you diligently keep these instructions. You diligently keep yourself in the way of God lest you forget these things and lest you depart from your heart all the days of your life. And if you depart from these things, where does the light go? Right? If Israel overall departs, there will be no light for the nations around about them to see it, for the, the, for the nations around about them to be drawn to it. And hence, it's not supposed to be just drawn to Israel, but who? Drawn to God. I think this portion is key for us today. As we seek to serve God in our daily lives, through prayers, studying his word, Bible studies, Shabbats, feasts, we must remember in the midst of cultivating our relationship with God that we are also being used as lights to the nations round about us. It's not just about us cultivating our relationship with God, but it's so much more. The whole point of cultivating the relationship with God is so that we are close with him, but so that he can prepare us to do work in the fields. That's the whole point. We are cultivated so that he could send us out to be laborers to the harvest that is plenty. We must seek to be lights to the weary, the brokenhearted, the poor, the needy, the ones calling out for a deliverance, a revival, an awakening. Yes, first and foremost, we must ensure we diligently keep ourselves focused on God. But our energy, our time, and our focus cannot end there. Throughout the Bible, God has referenced this need and this model where his chosen, his called out ones, were to follow him and live godly lives. But even more than that, they were to be used as end samples, as signs, as lights, 
to a darkened world around about them. We, we see this as God speaks to Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, which states, Now the Lord has said to Avram, Get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. We see even from the beginning here in God's message to Abram, that he would first bless Abraham and be with him. But also through Abram, many other nations and many other generations would be blessed as well. But they would only be blessed through Abram if Abram was steadfast in following God and his instructions and had the faith as we know he had. As well as steadfast in his faith, boldness and openness to follow God and be used in many different ways. Additionally, we see this message. You know, first, uh, that last comment I just made there, uh, that he's steadfast in his faith but, and boldness, but also his openness to follow God and openness to be used in many different ways. You know, I think a lot of people want to be used, but I think in the same sense, a lot of people uh, in, in the kingdom of God, uh, it's almost a Jonah experience, Right? Jonah wants to go uh, to Israel and, and to, to bring the, the salvation message, uh, the, the delivery message uh, to his people. You know, he doesn't want to go to Nineveh, right, to the extent that he tries to get on a ship and go a different direction. Clearly, that wasn't in God's plan. So it's similar to that, right? It's like, yes, we should all be open. We should all be seeking to help. And whether it's simple, practical ways of helping uh, individuals out, uh, the needy, the poor, feeding them, whatever it might be, um, or it, it could be a, a much greater uh, calling, who knows. But at the end of the day, we can't put limitations on who we help. We can't put limitations on who we go to, right? Because at the end of the day, we are a vessel for God to use. We are his vehicle. So if he chooses to send us to a, a, a nation, a people, an individual that we potentially didn't have on our, our, approved, on our approved list of people to help, well, that's too bad. That's not how God sets it up. So additionally, we see this message of God's people being used as a light to all nations in Isaiah 49, verse 6, which states, Indeed, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. It was always understood and planned since the beginning that through God's faithful the nations would be blessed and witness a light emanating from God's people that would draw them into the fold. That light would draw them towards Yeshua, would draw them towards God to be a part of his kingdom. For this to occur, God's faithful must stay faithful and seek to be used in this fashion and be open for the nations to come into the fold. I think this aspect was more difficult, is more difficult than it seems, especially for a nation that has been enslaved, attacked throughout their existence. You know, being open, as I was reading this verse and I, and I thought about it, you know, because we read this verse and we're like, of course, Israel's supposed to be the light, and then all nations are going to be drawn to it, and all nations are going to come in. But think about that and think about just the natural tendencies uh, of humans and our uh, interaction with strangers, right? Majority of times, you know, we struggle interacting with people we do not know. We struggle with people that we, we, are, uh, we are strangers with. So I, I put that in the same light in, in this about Israel being uh, drawing all the nations. You know, Israel had to be open for those nations to come. They had to be open that when those nations came, when those strangers from foreign lands came, they would be open to accepting them into their community. They would be open to teaching them, showing them ways of God. They wouldn't shun them. They wouldn't keep them away because they didn't fit a, a mold in a sense, right? Or because they didn't know them. Now, I think that, I think it probably was a little bit more difficult uh, than maybe we might think. Liken it to today. I believe everyone in this room desires to be used by God. Without a doubt, I see it all the time. We have, there's so many great hearts in this place.
there's a lot of, everyone in this room desires to be a light to all those around them, but how open are we to being a light, you know, defining a light here as spending time with individuals, helping them um, whatever they need help with, developing a relationship with them, you know, taking the time to spend, not just, you know, giving them something or, or, and moving on, but actually spending the time investing in their lives. You know, how open are we to groups around us that in times past have hated us or in times past we have had a huge disagreement with? What if they came from or, you were, or we were sent to these individuals or groups by God from a different religion, from a different political persuasion, a different economic class, a different job status, a different culture, a different race, Maybe individuals who are in prison because of theft or drug use in the past. If God showed up and said, I need you to go to these people, how would we react individually, collectively, whatever it might be? And I think this is a question and, and, and something God wants the whole kingdom of God, people in the United States, people in the world to question, to think about. How open are we to reaching out to these individuals? You know, what if they came, excuse me, you know, would we be open to be used as a light to each of these groups? Would we, in our minds, analyze, yeah, but that group or that person, I'm not so sure about because of this or this or there's this risk and that risk. Or would we, yes, God, I'll go. You, you're calling me to go, I'll go. For this is what God calls us to do. We are to be lights city upon a hills to whomever God so chooses. And we must be willing and open no matter what that person or group has done, believed in the past, we must be open to being a light to them. I mean, I think about, uh, you know, obviously scriptures in Samuel where it talks about that man does not see the heart of another man. Only God does. We see the outside, he sees the inside. Matthew 5, 14 through 16 states, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I think it's important for each of us to take an accounting of where we stand and how open, flexible we are in being a light for God and being used for God. Are we desiring to be used? Are we open to being used and willing to push aside our wants, our needs, our thoughts, our feelings about individuals or groups? Are we, able, are we willing to push aside all of that and push aside our time to invest the time in the harvest, to be the laborers and workers of the harvest? Are we engaged, act, engaged, active in the overall cultivation of the harvest? I mentioned it before. I personally believe that this is a huge opportunity for many to be awoken. I do think many are being awoken to God's kingdom. There's many things going on in this world, many people calling out for help. I think the harvest, like it's always been, is huge. Will we be laborers to step up to be used to bring forth that harvest? During the last couple of weeks, I watched a couple of movies, documentaries, true stories that depicted what we are talking about today. People of God taking action with their time and stepping up as a laborer in God's army for the harvest, for the awakening of souls that God is bringing forth. Each playing an integral role in the lives of tens, hundreds, and thousands of people. The, the real-life events, stories occurring in our day around the globe is absolutely inspiring. It's amazing that some of these documentaries, which I'm going to mention here in a little bit, but these documentaries I'm watching in actual events that are occurring. I mean, they're, they're inspiring, they're humbling, they're motivating, and absolutely they're biblical. They're literally biblical, like Yeshua walking on the water, healing the sick, changing the lives of many, awakening souls, biblical. And it's occurring today. People are forgoing their free time, forgoing their comforts, 
and going out into the fields for God to use them however he wishes. They are seeking to be the ones Yeshua intimately knows. They want to be known by God. As is described in Matthew 25, 31 through 46, which states, When a son of man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on, his, on the throne of his glory. And all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another. As a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats, he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared before you for the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and gave you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to the one of least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not take me in naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. Then they will also answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Certainly I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to the one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into everlasting life. This is, the one, this is one of the main sections of verses that always impacts me. You know, I know we've read it many times here, and, and many of us probably have read it many times over uh, just through reading the Bible. You know, I find it interesting that during such an impactful message from Yeshua, where he is discussing the difference between those who will be with him forever compared to those who will be in everlasting punishment. I mean, that's a hugely crucial uh, message. That's a hugely crucial uh, discussion occurring right there. I'm sure he had the ears of many round about him. He focuses on the simple, though. Isn't it very interesting? He's talking about those that will be with him forever and comparing those that will be in everlasting punishment. And what does he focus on? What does he emphasize? He has the ability to talk, talk about anything that he, that's been referenced in the Bible. Talk about anything of importance of what the children of God should do and how they should act and what they should follow. can say anything. But what does he do? He focuses on the simple, but extremely impactful actions of the saints. He focused the actions where individuals sought to help hungry, help the thirsty, the naked, the imprisoned, help the strangers. He didn't call out and say, these are the ones that will be with me forever. He didn't call out and say, the best teachers. He didn't say the best prophets or the most skilled prayer warriors, the best Bible studiers, researchers. No. He didn't mention any of those. He called out those laborers who went to those who were in need and helped them. Now clearly, just to be clear, those other aspects, roles and actions, are hugely important, clearly, right? We need teachers, we need prophets, we need prayer warriors, we need people to study the Bible. We all should be studying the Bible. Those are very, very important in the overall walk that we have with God. But we must look at those as prep work. We must look at those as those are the things we are doing. Obviously, being a prayer warrior, you're, you're, you're taking action with that as well. But the other ones, it's about preparation to go out and to be a laborer in the world. It's prep work to go take action, to be prepared, ready to go, having our loins girded, right? Having the full armor of God upon us, getting ready to go. Those are hugely important. 
And that's what God seeks and in a sense expects from his chosen. But he took this opportunity when he knew he would have everyone's attention to focus on the actions that may seem simple on the surface but make great impacts to those individuals receiving it. As I mentioned previously, I've been able to watch several true stories and documentaries that depict events, actions occurring today that we read about in the Bible and have been discussing. The one I want to mention today and encourage all of you to watch it when you have a chance is called Jesus in Athens. This is a documentary that Stephen, uh, Stephen and I were talking after Yeshiva this week, and he mentioned he watched this documentary called Jesus in Athens, um, and that he, you know, he thought it was pretty impactful, and uh, he encouraged me to watch it. So he brought it to my attention as it related to a conversation we were having that ended up being an understatement. The fact that I would find it interesting, farthest from the truth, it was unbelievable. And I'll be honest, it impacted my life uh, greatly. I'm going to try not to spoil the documentary for everyone. You know, I would love to, to tell you about all the events that occurred in it, to be honest with you. Um, but I'm going to tell you one, and then I'll encourage you to go, to go watch the others. Uh, but I do feel it's important to discuss some aspects of it as an encouragement for all of us. Because, to be honest with you, Watching this documentary and thinking about, uh, you know, and hearing these stories of God showing up, of Yeshua showing up in the physical and the audible, people hearing his voice clearly, people literally seeing a man dressed in white, I mean, these type of stories. And then, you know, not just clearly, those are unbelievably miraculous stories, but not only that, but also uh, people getting their souls being awakened and coming into the fold, people getting healed, uh, those who are sick getting healed, a variety of things that are occurring because laborers chose to be used by God. Laborers chose to get out of their house and just walk, chose to get out of their house to go to cities, go to places where they knew there would be people of need and just said, okay, how can I help? And out of that, congregations exploded. Out of that, hundreds came to the fold because there was a huge need. I mean, I said before, it was very inspirational, motivating, and humbling. I mean, it's crazy humbling to me, to be honest with you. Watching it, I'm like, yeah, I definitely don't do near enough. I definitely don't live out the... Uh, feed, uh, feed the hungry, the thirsty. You know, it makes you do an accounting. It makes you review your life and what you're spending your time on and how you're helping people or, or how you're shutting people out. You know, I think about, and sorry, I'll get to you in a second, but I, I think about Shabbat and we have such a phenomenal uh, community, phenomenal people here. And, you know, a part of Shabbat, clearly God gives us a day of rest to just spend time with him. Gives us a day of rest to clear our minds, like I prayed earlier, of the world, of the stress, of everything. To come and be in comfort and peace with like-minded, like-spirited people. And when you look at Shabbat and the reasons why God gave it, you know, back in biblical times, they were getting persecuted all week long. They were going out into the world. They were, and then they would go out into the world. They would come back to Shabbat together. They'd be sharing these great stories of how God moved. How God's hand was helping those who needed help. God's hand was healing those. God was doing all these things, right? They would come back and share it for encouragement to those being persecuted to overcome. And also just as a refreshing and a thanksgiving to praising God. Look what's going. Let's look what's going on in our lives and our communities. You know, and I think about um, our Shabbats, you know, and in, in the United States or, or in places of comfort, like I mentioned before, you know, this comfort and peace, those, those civilizations that have been in this comfort bubble for many years, you, you, kind, of, you, you kind of lose some of that stories to where you, you show up and you're really, hey, so how's work? Did you have a good time at work? You know, and it's almost like we're using the, the Shabbat as a rest from work, not a rest from laboring for God but a less for really a rest for really laboring um, for ourselves, I guess you could say, or for the, our, our managers or CEOs, right? Um, but, you know, th these are all the things that are going through my head that 
you know, when you have when you have individuals really stepping out and seeing the hand of God move, you know, how awesome would it be to come here every Shabbat and people, and we do have that. I mean, obviously, we do, I don't know about every Shabbat, but um, we do have uh, a lot of times people come in, in this Shabbat and share, it's a, share the, um, the praises and exhortations, share what God has done, right? And when we have had people share those things, how does that make you feel? It encourages us, right? It motivates us. It's like, like, I want to see the hand of God move. I want to be used to make a difference in this world for God, right? When you hear those things, you get motivated. And and that's basically what I'm trying to explain. When I watch this documentary, and again, I encourage you guys to watch it, I feel like it will do the same. That it would motivate you, inspire you, encourage you. um, to. If you're not active, I'm, I'm assuming there are many active laborers already, but if you're not active, to get active. And if you are active, to continue to be active uh, in laboring for God. But anyways, this documentary takes place in Athens, where they and um, all of Greece as a whole is experiencing unprecedented immigration from Turkey and surrounding countries, which basically, and which Turkey is just about four miles um, through, uh, connect some islands, about four miles away over a stretch of water uh, between um, Greece and Turkey. So this documentary goes into how millions and millions of people, mostly Muslims, are leaving their homelands due to war, poverty, persecution. Those who make it are basically placed in camps until they get processed and sent on whether they're staying in Greece or they're going to a different country just using Athens or Greece as a uh, pass-through. Initially, I must admit, watching a documentary about immigration, uh, millions of people flooding from other countries into Greece and, uh, and a documentary about uh, completely about Muslims making this immigration. You know, I allowed my views, um, my fleshly views about immigration and negative views of Muslims and really, not Muslims, but the Muslim nation uh, and, their, and the portions of them, their hate for us to cause me to, be, to, to make it difficult to watch in the beginning. You know, I, I had thoughts come to my mind about, here we go, another immigration kind of show. Here we go, you know, about Muslims and, you know, all these different thoughts and all these different um, opinions raced in my mind, which clearly was the flesh of me. Thankfully, I kept watching. And as I kept watching, those fleshly views waned away and my spirit was overflowed. It was overflowed in me to see what God is doing amongst those people. Amongst really many of these people. How he is sending his laborers out into the harvest to awaken the souls of his chosen. And that's where when I earlier said, do we allow um, all the different groups, you know, if, if an individual is not a part of an approved list of groups that we have in our minds, do we allow that uh, to stop us from spending time with them, investing in them. You know, whether, like I said, whether it's different religions, political persuasions, and economic classes, job statuses, do we allow those things to limit who we reach out to? This taught me a great lesson and showed me how much I allow things occurring in our nation or in our world to cloud and in some places close off my spirit to certain groups and people, regardless of, regardless if I think this type of immigration is legal or not, or good for a country or not, or good for you know, the economic system or not, regardless if I think that, or, or regardless of what groups of Muslims have done in the past, I should never allow those thoughts and feelings to preclude me from helping them, praying for them, and desiring their souls to be awakened. And definitely regardless of what I think, as we know, God is able to use any situation to bring forth his glory and his salvation to all. One story that I want to share that was impactful, there's probably like seven or eight stories. I'm just going to share one today, but uh, to me it it was pretty impactful. So, uh, there's in this video, uh, it had to do with God literally showing up to people in the physical and calling out to them. So what happened was, 
just like many, many, many of the immigrants, they would set sail in a, in a raft from uh, Turkey to uh, Greek islands and make their way to Greece, about a four mile stretch. They would do this during the night, so it's pitch black out, in a boat filled with 10 to 15 people, a uh, 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 blown up boat or whatever. So they would be making their way across the water and this specific boat uh, had like 10 people in it, had a family of three, a part of the 10 people. And it was, a, it was a, a husband, a wife, and a daughter. Daughter probably was five to seven years old. As they were making their way over the water, all of a sudden, because the, the water's crazy waves and everything, all of a sudden the daughter flew out of the boat and fell in the water. And clearly everybody was frantic. Everyone's screaming, but they couldn't see anything because it's pitch black. Uh, couldn't see anything. And it's funny because we always talk about light shines the, the greatest in a, a very dark state, right? So it was very dark outside. And they couldn't see her. They couldn't hear her. And she flew out. A couple minutes go by. They keep calling, looking, nothing, no avail. All of a sudden, and, uh, you know, if the boat is uh, long ways, you know, she was in the middle of the boat sitting there. And once she flew out. And then after a couple minutes, they look around and everybody turns their back to the front of the boat, and there she is, sitting at the front of the boat. And all she keeps repeating is, a man in white clothing walked on water, grabbed my hand, and put me in the boat. A man in white walked on water, grabbed my hand, and put me in the boat. So clearly, clearly Yeshua, right? Them being from a Muslim nation, they didn't they didn't connect the dots. They didn't know who Yeshua was. They didn't even know that Yeshua walks on water and all that stuff, right? So, I'll be honest. I mean, if that was the only part of the story, that would be enough, right? Dayenu. Without a doubt, Dayenu. That would have been enough. What's even greater, and to show an example of how God needs laborers and how God uses laborers, after, you know, that occurs, they're in the boat, they make their way to the beach. There's this, uh, there's this uh, gentleman, a Christian, um, on this island who every so often, I'm not sure if he does it every day, but every so often, probably when he can, he goes out to the beach um, and he builds a fire. And because he knows that there are going to be immigrants coming over the water. And so he knows that they're probably going to be cold and they might need a fire. So he goes out there, builds a fire, stands by the fire, reading his Bible. And, you know, he says sometimes nobody would come. Sometimes I would get one person, sometimes ten. And, you know, as we're sitting by the fire and we're having, you know, just an introductory type of conversations, you know, I asked him if, if I could share a story with him. Well, this specific day, when this girl falls out of the boat, rescued by Yeshua, put back in the boat, they come to the beach, and this, this family of three, and they stand by, they ask, can we, can we stand by the fire too? And he's like, sure. And they start talking and stuff. He's like, would you mind if I share a story? Well, it just so happened that on that day, a story he's never shared before to anybody on that beach was a story about Yeshua walking on the water, that God placed it upon his heart to teach that story. And he said immediately, that whole family busted into tears. And what happened was that family said, we don't know who, who is this Yeshua. And he explained, and then they said, can we have that Bible? That is impactful, right? Now, clearly, that is a very impactful. So when I, we talk about laborers today and going help out the needy and the hungry, yeah, we might not all experience a story like that or an event like that, right? But I think it shows a perfect example of why we cannot just be resting in a sense on our laurels and resting on just spending time with God, but that we literally have to take that resting with God, take that spending time with him, studying, uh, talking, all this type of stuff that we do, right? Celebrating feasts, all that. But we must take all that to get prepared to go out and take action in this world so that we can be used as laborers. Again, there's many other examples of Yeshua showing up in the physical, man dressed in white, 
speaking to me, saying I am the door, variety of other uh, uh, examples. I encourage you to go see the documentary Jesus in, As uh, Jesus in Athens. Um, I, I, there, there's probably many documentaries like this, but I would encourage you to watch it. it it's very impactful. So to finish this teaching, I wanted to spend a bit uh, on the title for today's message. Raise a hallelujah. So this is a Christian song that is new to me last night, but I know it's very old. Um, this song came out of a group of people praying for the healing of a congregational leader's son who was about to die from E. coli poisoning. So as people prayed, a husband and wife who are worship leaders began to sing uh, this phrase, sing this tune, this tune, raise a hallelujah. Basically, the song and this phrase was a charge to take action. As they were going and interceding for this, the congregational leader's son, because um, they, received, they received word that he was about to die, as they were taking action and, and interceding and praising God and praying and seeking out for God to bring forth his hand of healing upon them, they started singing Raise a Hallelujah. And, and for, for those of you who don't know, Hallelujah, Hebrew term, Hallel, which means praise, Yah, which means God or a variation of that name. Um, so really they're saying raise a praise God. So in this case, it was to intercede through prayer and worship for this little boy who ended up being healed. But as I listen to the song and as you listen to the words, you know, it really is a charge to prepare you to intercede for those, clearly, who need help, but also to prepare you to go out into the world to be used as a laborer. It's, used to, it's a charge to have as a, as a way, a shout, a, a, a war cry, whatever you might want to put around it, but basically an encouraging, motivating phrase to speak about and to sing about what your God either is about to do or what your God has done. Two places in the Bible where groups of people raised a hallelujah in difficult times and saw the hand of God move mightily can be found in 2 Chronicles verse 20, or chapter 20, verse 2, which states, As they began to sing in praise, the Lord set an ambush against the men who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. And then uh, Acts chapter 16, verses 25 through 34. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open, everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awake, awakening from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do, not, do, no, do yourself no harm, for we are all here. And he called for a light and ran in and fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord, Yeshua the Messiah, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them in the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. Paul and Silas, great laborers of God, were put into an environment where they were imprisoned. And instead of wallowing all night, instead of complaining and crying out to God and saying, what about me? Do you not hear me? Do you not see me? Can you save me? No, they praised God. They raised a hallelujah. They took action, and through being a laborer, through taking action, not caring about their physical plight at the moment, many more were saved. Through God hearing their praises, caused the foundations to open up and to show the power of God, where God got all the glory and all those were saved. Through the actions of God's people, through the actions of laborers, God using these laborers, People are physically saved. People are physically healed. People are fed. People are clothed. All of which are critical to the awakening of souls destined for the kingdom of God. So the charge today, as we raise our hallelujahs, as we go forth, 
Let us be laborers that God seeks, because the harvest, as we all know, is plenty. Amen? It is, my, it is our duty to praise the master of all, to ascribe greatness to the author of creation. For he made us unlike the nations of the lands, and has not planted us like the families of the earth. He has not made our portion like theirs and our lot like their multitudes. And we bend the knee and bow and acknowledge our thanks before the King over kings, the Holy One, blessed be he. He stretches out heaven and establishes earth's foundation. And the seat of his glory is in the heavens above, and the presence of his power is in the most exalted heights. He is our God, there is none other. True is our King. There is nothing beside him as it is written in his Torah. And you shall know this day and take to your heart that the Lord he is God in the heavens above and on the earth below. There is none other. Amen. Let us stand together. I lift up my eyes to your throne, Lord, as I lose myself in you, the song in my heart will be yours treasure is in no
Sign your glory, we give our lives fully to you. Here inside your presence, taken by the wonder of you. Here inside your glory, we give our lives fully.
sign of glory. That's why my life's full of you. Oh 
desire to be holy in your sight we ask father that you would move and that you would touch each and every person here this family lord god that we are part father that you would guide and direct each and every one in these times father that you'd open our eyes to see our ears to hear father that your spirit and your presence would wrap around us lord that you would protect us from the sicknesses of the disease of the world father that you would protect our children lord and that, Lord God, we would get through this together, Lord, and all these things that are happening around about us at this time. Oh God, that we would be able to see your light shine through. The world is dark, and in a dark place, light shines. And we ask that you would shine through us. We bless you. We thank you. We praise you. Shem Yishua Mashiach. This week was, uh, this week on Wednesday was an interesting it was a day, I don't know if you guys know, that it was Tisha B'Av. Tisha B'Av is the ninth of, uh, is the ninth of Av. It's the saddest day in Jewish history. It's the saddest day in the time of Israel. It's the day of the destruction of the temple. It's the day that Israel experienced a deep sadness. So this week on Wednesday, if you were experiencing something interesting, uh, a sadness, a breaking. The spirit of Tisha B'Av was real. Um, the temple was destroyed, and our temples are being destroyed. Congregations around the world are being destroyed. The world is a mess, and people don't know what to do. And it feels about the same way. Um, there's an interesting thing. I was watching a, a, a pastor and a professor. His name's Dr. Vodi Bacham. I don't know if you know who that is. Bacham Bacham. I don't know his last name. But Dr. Vodi Bacham. This guy is a pretty amazing. Uh, he's a pretty amazing speaker. He has a very amazing background. But he was talking about all the things that are going around. And he, he brought up a scripture. Uh, And I think that it applies to the world. It applies to this time. And it kind of gives us an insight on who we should be. It's not mine. That's why I'm sharing that it was his. He was talking about all the race, you know, racial tensions that are existing. He's a black gentleman raised in South L.A. by a teenage mother, drug-infested. And this guy just, you know, sprouted to be an amazing person. And you should look him up. Um, he's a Christian, obviously. Um, but he started and he, and he said, in, in, times of, in times of great distress and things that are going on, we have to look at the, we have to go to the Bible to see what is to be done. So he goes to First Chronicles chapter 12, which I thought was an interesting place to go because it's dealing with the transition of David and Saul's kingdom. How David is transitioning into becoming the kingdom of uh, the king of all of Israel. And, it, and he starts reading. He says, these are the numbers of the bands that were ready armed, that were ready armed to the war and came to David to Hebron to turn the kingdom of Saul to him according to the word of the Lord. So David needed armies to go to war to take the kingdom of Saul and put it in his name, that he would be the mighty king. It says, the children of Judah that bear shield and spear, there were 6,800 ready armed to go to war. Of the children of Simeon, mighty men of valor for the war, 7,100. Mighty men of valor. Of the children of Levi, 4,600. And Jehoiada was the leader of the Aaronites, and with him were 3,700. And Zadok, a young man mighty of valor, and of his father's house, twenty and two captains. And of the children of Benjamin, the, the kindred of Saul, three thousand, for hitherto the greatest part of them had kept the ward of the house of Saul. 
And of the children of Ephraim, 20,800 mighty men of valor, famous throughout the house of their fathers. And of the half-tribe of Manasseh, 18,000, which were expressed by name to come and make David king. And of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do, the heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their command. I'll stop there. He lists out all the mighty men of war, and he points out that you need men of war. You need shields. You need spear at times like this, especially when David was trying to become king. But more importantly, you need Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. That's a totally different way of looking at it. These men were just the men of understanding what's going on around about us. A lot of times we all want to pick up a spear and a shield. I want to all the time. I look at it and I'm like, well, I'm ready to go to war. Maybe, like Brian's talking, we are laborers of God, remember. And to be laborers of God, we have to have understanding. In order to get understanding, we have to pray. And when we pray, we learn what we ought to do. Remember in, when Israel was fighting the Philistines and they were coming out and, God, and he asked God, should I go out to them? And he goes into this valley where they all gather together. And in that valley, David, you know, he says, God, should I go out to get them? He prayed. He asked, should I go out to get them? And God said, yes, go up and get them. And I will deliver you. So then he gets up and he goes into the valley and he delivers them and, he, and they take all of them. And then all of a sudden it happens again where they come. And David, David asks God again. He goes back to God in prayer and he says, God, should I go out to get them? And so God says to him, no, don't go out to get them. Go behind the mulberry bushes. And if you go behind the mulberry bushes, then I, then I will free you and I will get you, Right? If we lack understanding, it's because we're not praying. David prayed every time. He, he, he actually didn't, he needed the kings of, he needed the people of Issachar to show them. Why? Because they were probably in prayer, seeking God and understanding the times that were going on around them. And, and they were guiding these men of war and men of valor. It's the same thing. We have to be those people. I think what Brian was talking about today, and that's why I'm even sharing it, because Brian's making a point. We are the laborers. Who else is? Who else is laboring? Like, it, it feels like there's no voice for God in the world today. Where is God's voice? Where is it? It's lost. You don't hear about it. That's politics. This mask thing, this is politics. It has nothing to do with God's voice. God's voice cannot be math, masked. Don't be confused. That's, not, that's a lack of understanding. We are the voice of God with the mask or without a mask. So it's an important part of our faith as a people. You know, I was watching too, these, these, these groups are very, very, they're struggling. There's this concept of intersectionality where if you're not if you're not white if you're not uh, if you're not a male if you're if you're not heterosexual if you're not this or that you, you're 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 not privileged right so if you're any of those then those are the intersections where you experience racism or whatever it may be guess what what's the bible say in yeshua there is neither jew nor greek there is neither free nor slave. This is the even most interesting one. There's neither male nor female. How, how can we not see and show love regardless if that's who we are? We know who we are in Yeshua and there is no distinction between you and me. Love is what kills the hate. Light, it was what drowns out darkness. How do we be the light? How do we show love? How do we labor in love and labor in light for the world to see that? 
we can make a difference in our own communities and in our own ways, and we can have heart for people that that have maybe feelings that are that are different from ours, and we have to learn to show that. I think that's part of the labor and love. You know, Yeshua literally, according to the story that Brian told, Yeshua literally walked on water, grabbed the hand of a little Muslim girl, pulled her out of the water and placed her back in the boat. She wasn't a Christian. Her parents weren't Christian. They weren't raised that way. He didn't follow the Bible. He wasn't a God-fearing, Torah-believing Jewish man, Christian. He was a Muslim, and he raised his child out of the water and put her into the boat. It didn't matter that they followed the Word of God. Yeshua protected that little girl, and guess what? That's love. And that love converted, for sure, those people to his kingdom. That's a different way of thinking. It's a different mindset. It's, you know, and I think now is the time to start seeing things a little bit different. Brian talked about his, uh, his perceptions before he started watching the video, how he had perceptions about uh, immigration and perceptions about Muslims and blah, 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 blah. Those perceptions in God... It's, we have, there, there is a sea of people that need God's love. No matter who they are. No matter what their socioeconomic position, no matter what their cultural, religious understanding is, those people need God. The hardest part is figuring out how we can labor to give them God and throw away our perceptions of who they are and not, re- and not sacrifice who God has made us and what he's taught us as a people. That's the hard part. So this week, be encouraged to pray, to ask God for understanding of the times and to show us what we ought to do. Amen. Yevarecha Adonai veYishmerecha ya er Adonai panavelecha vichunecha yesa Adonai panavelecha veasem lecha shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom, shalom, Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Even come quickly, Lord Yeshua. Amen and Amen. Shavuot Tov. There we go. Um, so my bat mitzvah is coming up, and I have to do my. Sadaka project, and I am painting journals and rocks, and I'm going to be raising money for the lone sh- soldiers in Israel. Israel. Uh, they're going to be on the back table, and we are going to be printing out some information, and yeah. <laughs> I'm a little nervous. Um, yeah, so. So he's going to be painting rocks. Uh, so as you know, this, during this time, typically for the Bat Mitzvah Sadaka project, it's about um, helping people, going to those nursing homes, people in need. It's all about interaction with people and helping them out. Well, considering the times is very interesting over the past few months, um, sort of Ava's using sort of her skills that God's blessed her with, of uh, her love for art and painting, just to rate, you know, paint rocks, journals. And she's going to do that to raise money for the Lone Soldier Project in Israel. And for those who don't know, Lone Soldiers are those soldiers in Israel that have no family. They have no connection. They have no um, support, basically, in Israel. So they're on their own. And they're not, let alone they're fighting and giving their lives to help the Jewish nation be protected. So um, Ava thought that would be a good project for, to help raise money for that. Um, so, yeah, the trucks will be in the back. Uh, we'll outline exactly. We'll just raise money for them, so how much the rocks are. 
Um, so we'll do that. So that's over the next month, maybe more. We'll see. Um, Ava also has invitations for the Bar party and stuff like that for uh, you know September 5th. So we'll be passing those out as well. So that's it. anything else? Wrap it up. Good. Okay. Right. Sure. <laughs> Just real quick, uh, we have Yeshiva this week, 7.30 to 9 o'clock. There's the women's luncheon tomorrow at 10 a.m. at the Askey's house. Uh, Patty, do you have any special? I know we have a sign-up list in the back. Just sign up. Obviously, uh, hopefully you've already signed up. But if you haven't, please sign up. Um, do they need to bring anything or anything like that? A breakfast side dish, if you could bring that. That would be awesome. Again, starts at 10 a.m. at the Askey household. If you need directions, please see her or Paul. And I'm sure that they'll both be able to help you out. Um, and just a reminder that the Zadaka Box and Backs ties offerings donations. Alongside here to the left is your praise reports and prayer requests. But everyone have a wonderful week. Shavuot Tov.